Good day, fellow investors. Welcome to another video where we discuss stocks, investments, and make stock analysis. What we did over the last week, 10 days, was to look at all, all of them, railroad stocks. And in this video, I'm going to give you a thesis of why one could consider investing in railroads. So if you're invested in one of those railroads, it will give you a great perspective on whether you should hold, sell, or buy more. If you're not invested, it might give you an idea for great businesses because railroads are great businesses. If you don't care about railroads, it will give you a great indication on what to look for when investing and looking at other businesses. We're going to discuss all these numbers really in detail. There is a link to the individual stock analysis article that I wrote in the description of the YouTube. If you will get value from this comprehensive sector analysis, that's all that I do. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel and click a like button if you liked this. The four key investment factors that make railroads a great business are a moat, growth ahead, increasing profitability, and then, of course, you always want to buy a great business at a fair price. And we'll also discuss that in the valuation part. Whether railroads should be in your portfolio? Well, in 2009, we all know that Buffett acquired Burlington Northern. So one of the seven class one railroads is in his portfolio. And we have to see whether the other six left out there to be traded should be added to our portfolio. It's actually a bet on America. So do you want to bet on America by owning a railroad? Historically, over the last 5-10 years, those bets on America did extremely well as all the railroad stocks outperformed the S&P 500. So those really did well. However, the valuation now is equal and I would even dare to say that railroad stocks will continue to outperform the S&P 500. That's something we'll discuss through this video. So let's start with the railroad thesis. What are the four key factors? Mode, growth, profitability, increased profitability, high returns of capital employed, and then compare that all into evaluation, compare all the railroads later, and you'll see whether this fits your portfolio or not. And in any case, I hope I give you value from an investing education perspective. So let's start with the mode. This is the system, railroad system map in the United States, Canada, Mexico. Railroads don't own the infrastructure in Mexico, but they do own everything, all the rails, everything in Canada and the United States since the Staggart Act in 1980. When you build a railroad, when you make one, nobody's going to build another one here because it would be an economic disaster because the competition would eat all the profits away and nobody would make any money. So once you have built it and th these railroads were built over the last century, then you can enjoy the economic benefits of transporting goods across your railroad. Therefore, railroads have a strong moat and that's why Warren Buffett bought Burlington Northern in 2009. A moat means that the business has high barriers to entry. It would be extremely costly for someone now to even just think about replicating the infrastructure. These railways have been creating over the last hundred hundred and more years and have consolidated over the last 40 years. There were 40 railroads and now there is only seven left as each of those consolidated. With more traffic, all of that became more and more profitable. This is the railroad of Can Canadian National and you see how they don't really overlap Burlington Northern Union Pacific, here a little bit more of overlapping, but of course there is a lot of traffic going on here. So really, really each railroad is profitable for itself and serves serves its geographical location. Plus, 
There are other trends favoring rails even against other competition like trucking. Trucking regulations, driver shortages, growing environmental pressure, this we'll discuss in a second, highway congestions and aging public infrastructure. As I said, the railroads own and they have invested about $700 billion in their infrastructure over the last 30-40 years, which means they have quality infrastructure, which gives them another advantage against other competitors. So they have also a moat, not just from a railroad perspective, but also from a perspective of competing with other transportation methods. You can see here the map of Union Pacific Railroads, a lot of rail, a lot of traffic, and really tough to compete with this. But this, the railroad, the North American railroads, are the core of the American economy. So investing in one of those is betting on America. Kansas City Southern that expands also into Mexico, which offers growth also from that perspective of being connected with an emerging market. So when it comes to moat, you don't have to worry about a competitor because they are not going to build something next to you. You have a lower cost, better, you're more environmentally friendly than the competition in other transportation segments. So you can invest, you can invest so that you become more and more profitable. And if there is growth, so growth in traffic, economic growth, your fixed costs stay fixed. That's always the same cost to maintain, to upgrade that railway, etc. But more traffic means more revenues, means higher margins, and higher margins is what determines a great business. Also, there is growth. Okay, you can say in the next 20 years, the expectations from the Association of American Railroads is for 30%, for a 30% increase in freight transportation. You might say 30% is not much, but keep in mind the higher profitability, the higher margins that these make because of their modes and no competition in their area, then you think how important is the small 30% increase for profitability growth. Also, their goal is to take as much traffic as possible from trucks, etc. Because with just a single gallon, a ton can travel on average 470 miles in the United States, which is the most efficient way to transport goods across the country. Also from an environmental perspective, look at the gas emissions. So freight rail, just 2% of gas emissions compared to 23.5% of trucking and cars, etc. But 23% of trucking, the competitor, versus 2% of rail is really something amazing. So if you want to hold something sustainable in your portfolio, environmentally sustainable, you might want to consider railroads. And when it comes to profits, as I said, revenues increase, fixed costs stay fixed, plus there is something called precision schedules, railroading that all the class one stocks that we're going to discuss have been implementing or have started to implement where those focus on making their business as profitable as possible, increase velocity, achieve better fuel efficiency, move that cargo load as profitably as possible. And we can see that train speeds have increased over the last years and terminal dwell time has actually been decreasing on average. All of this means better operating ratios, higher profits. And we can see that railroads, stocks, return on invested capital, return on capital employed has been growing slowly and steadily over the last years. If I put an average trend on here, I am seeing growth with return on capital employed employed, which means higher profitability, which is another sign of a great business. However, railroads are definitely a great business, but the question is, what's the price? A great business that's overvalued will lead to good long-term returns. 
but a great business that's fairly valued will likely lead to great long-term returns. And now we have to discuss the valuation. Yes, the stocks have outperformed the S&P 500, but it might be that those will outperform the S&P 500 also over the next five, 10 years, which would make them a great investment again. So let's discuss valuation. Union Pacific has a price earnings ratio of 25. So that's a 4% return. We are going to use free cash flow as a way to value railroads, discuss more of that later in the comparison part. But when you compare that to the S&P 500, actually it's a better earnings yield. This is 4%. The S&P 500 is having a yield that is a little bit lower as the price earnings ratio is higher at the moment. But then if you compare the yield, the 4% earnings yield to what you get in a bank and add taxes on that, 0 to 1%. In Europe, you can get something on your bank savings only if you invest in a bank, I don't know, in Bulgaria or those small banks in Italy that go bankrupt every quarter, then you might get something. If not, you are looking at likely a negative yield in Europe. So a 3%, 4% earnings yield with some growth, owning a great business is an attractive investment. And this is the, also the risk and the reward. If you compare railroad stocks and their valuation to the low interest rates you get in a bank, given that this is a good business, then railroad stocks are still cheap. And let's now compare all of them. Here you have the stock tickers. All of them have a strong mode. I'm not going to discuss here LB Foster. It's not really a railroad, but it's connected. So I included there in the sector. So let's stick to railroads and let's compare and let's see what it is about when it comes to investing in railroads. So as I said, the best way to value railroads, we're going to discuss the takeover bid. So owner's perspective, buyback activity, the debt and the growth ahead. Let's start with the free cash flow yield. So the free cash flow yield is 3%, 3%, 5.5% 5 .5 from CSX because of the coal exposure. It's likely the market doesn't really like the coal exposure and thinks that this might go down to the average 3, 3.5 to 4 that other railroads offer. But then, as I mentioned, also Kansas City Southern rejected recently a 20 billion takeover bid from Global Infrastructure Partners and Blackstone Group. And they have rejected an offer at a 3% cash flow yield. So if I compare their rejection to other businesses out there. There is still plenty of upside for, for example, CXX, but I don't know who will come up with a hundred billion to take over CSX. So that's why they tried to take over the smallest railroad there. The Canadians are fairly priced for the takeover bid. And there is still 20% upside from NSC and United Pacific, but 166 billion will be hard to come from for United Pacific. However, if we go to KSU, well, $208 per share and they have rejected it. And I'm going to tell you why they rejected it. The number of shares outstanding and all the railroads are doing buybacks is now 94 million. If they keep doing buybacks over the next two years, they might lower the number of shares outstanding to 84 million thanks to the free cash flows a little bit of debt if they go to the buyer the buyer has to pay the same price but the shareholders would receive a higher stock price on the same takeover deal amount because of the lower number of shares so probably this is the reason why the management declined rejected the offer if they can get let's say 21 or 22 23 billion just sweeten the deal a little bit up and they can use the free cash flows they are currently making to lower the number of shares, I think they can push this stock even to 250, 230, 250, which would give a good return over the next year or 
too. But this shows, okay, everybody's focused on returns. And actually, when there is a takeover, you can cash out from the investment. So KSU is a very interesting investment from that perspective. Also, it's the smallest, so it might be attractive to investment funds. But let's discuss buybacks, which are the very core of all traded companies. Everybody has extremely strong buybacks. And if the free cash flow yield is 3%, they pay out the dividend and they take on more debt to push that buyback yield even higher, 3-4%. So the buyback plus dividend yield for all of them is around 4-5% because all of them are growing debt to do as much buybacks as they can to push that stock prices higher. Of course, the only company not doing buybacks is Burlington Northern Santa Fe, which would be worth 200 billion. But for that, I'll make a spe special video I'm discussing also Berkshire's valuation. So please subscribe to see that and get notified when it comes out. Also, they have no debt and they can borrow and do crazy things. But that's the difference between a publicly listed and a non-listed railroad. As I said, the debt to cash flow is six with all of them, except from CSX, perhaps it will even out over the coming years. Debt to assets depends how you measure those assets. If you have historical assets that have been depreciated already, then those are not on the balance sheet. So not really a ratio to use. This is the best ratio to use for debt. And they have all the same ratios. Growth, slow for Canadians, CSX depending on coal, Kansas City Southern has a good growth like likelihood thanks to Mexico and no growth for these two railroads ahead. If I look at what's not nice with the company, the Canadians are expensive, CSX is doing a lot of debt and buybacks, LB Foster is ugly value, but there can be some investment thesis there below 10 KSU, similarly debt and buyback, but sweetened by the takeover deal. No growth, unfortunately, for the last two, as I already mentioned. And the big ones are unlikely to be taken over because they are simply too big. It's difficult to come up to borrow to take over something at 150 or 100 billion. So we have good businesses, free 4% free cash flow yield, all doing buybacks, taking on debt to push that stock price higher, which means that likely over the short to medium term, as long as they have the liquidity to push that stock higher, stocks will go higher and outperform the S&P 500. Which stock will go the highest? KSU likely because of the takeover sweetener when everybody can really cash out. Others will push, push, push. But at the moment where the, there is a liquidity contraction, and that's perhaps why Burlington has absolutely no debt, perhaps Burlington will start taking over the assets because all these buyback games are great until all goes well. If there is a liquidity contraction, an economic contraction that lowers the cash flows, then suddenly there is nothing to protect the stock price and you see a great crash, stock crash, like it was the case I don't know, for General Electric. So this is financial engineering. This is the sport all listed railroads are doing, which increases the risk. So you have to think, okay, railroads, I have to think about to get out in time because before the house of cards based on financial engineering crashes can last for another 10 years. It has been going on for already 10 years. So look also, you have it in the articles, the average interest rates they are paying. Some are paying 6% interest rate and then do buybacks at 3%. That's not that smart. Issued 100 year loans with 6% interest. So that's something to consider when it comes to the buyback game. Also, to take advantage of the buyback game, at some point you have to sell. KSU, takeover, okay, cashing out. Bigger companies don't have anyone that will buy them out. So buybacks, buybacks, yes, but the debt load is growing, growing, which increases the risk. So that's something to watch very carefully. 
However, great businesses, high margins, you need your cars, you need your grain, you need your food, and that's what these businesses are providing at the cheapest cost, best environment, and likely long-term stability. So if you enjoyed this, please subscribe. If you enjoyed this approach to investing analysis sector and stock analysis, valuation, value investing, you can check my book, you can check my research platform where you have my portfolios, where you have many more sector analysis, and you can read more and look for more videos on my website. Also, there is, uh, if you're interested in more transportation stocks, I have made the same analysis for all airport stocks, which I think are better risk reward than airline stocks in this COVID environment. I'll put that also in the link in the description below. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. It means a lot so that we can reach that 100,000 subscribers. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your comments. And I'll see you in the next video.